Firstly, I want to say it's a great pleasure to be here in Turin, Torino. I've never been here before and it's a beautiful city. So I'm Alex Bellos and just want to give you a bit of a background of who I am and where I come from. So I studied mathematics at university. I loved mathematics as a child. But I also like writing and I like books. So I went to university to study mathematics and philosophy. But I got distracted by newspapers and journalism. So after university, I left mathematics and for about 15 years was a journalist. I started off at a small newspaper in Brighton in the south of England. Then I went to The Guardian, which was my dream to work for a big London newspaper. And then I moved to South America as the foreign correspondent for The Guardian. Then I came back to London and I didn't really know what to do. So I thought, why don't I look back at my first love, mathematics, but look back with the eyes of a foreign correspondent. So I decided to travel to the world of mathematics as a foreign correspondent. And this was not just an abstract idea into mathematical ideas. I wanted to go on geographical journeys. So I spent one year going around the world. I went to France, to Germany, to America. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about experiences that I had in India and in Japan. So where do you start when you want to write about mathematics? You start with one. And I became interested not just in mathematics, but in the psychology of mathematics. Where do numbers come from? And what I want to do now is conduct an experiment of quite a new field of numerical cognition. And this is the simplest experiment, the most famous experiment. And I will show you a number of dots on the screen. And you will tell me how many dots you see. So this is easy, one. Thank you. That's three, yeah? <laughs> okay, the point, obviously, is that when I show you one, two, three, and four, it feels instant. But then when I show you 23, it takes a long time. Now, actually, if we were in a lab and I was timing you properly, we would see that with one dot, two dot, and three dots, it really is instant. But with four dots, we start to do something else. We actually start to count. So there is a small bit of time that we need extra for the four dots. If there were five dots, there'd be another little bit. Six dots, a little bit. And these little bits add up so that when they're 23, you really notice it. Well, this is interesting because it shows that there are two ways of understanding numbers. Either to subitize, to instantly see it, or to count. And, well, why is this interesting? This is culturally very interesting. It shows us, for example, these are three number numeral systems. 
This is India from about one and a half thousand years ago. These are the kanji characters in contemporary China and also, also in Japan. And this is a, a type of numbers from a, somewhere where I think you probably know. And what you see very clearly is that one, two, and three can be one, two, and three lines. But four is never four lines because it would be a terrible system because we'd have to be doing something extra. Now, one time I was giving a talk like this in a nice old building in England, and there was a big clock on the side of the wall with the numbers in Roman numerals. And for four, it was I, 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 I. And I was saying, this seems to disprove everything that I'm saying. But actually, it confirms what I was saying. It is actually true that the Romans used to use I, 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 I on clock faces. But that's because the position tells us what the number is. So, I, 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 I is more aesthetic, it's more beautiful. So that's why it was used. But for the purposes of counting, I, V was used. Now, let's look at India a bit closer. This is one uh, numeral system that emerged in India about one and a half thousand years ago. Now, imagine if you had to write this without taking your pencil off the paper. Well, if they had pencils, then, <laughs> yeah. You would get this. I think you probably recognize it. This was the origin of what we call Arab numerals. So we, they're not actually Arab numerals because they came from India first. <laughs> we should call them Indian numerals. Why do we use Indian numerals? It's not because of one, two, and three, and four. It's because of something else. It's because India was where zero was invented. Like there's a joke in England and in India, this, which I hope is translatable, which <laughs> is, what has India given the world? Nothing. <laughs> That's right, niente nulla is a bit different. But actually, nothing is the greatest gift possible that any civilization has maybe given humanity. Because zero made counting possible for everybody. Have you ever tried to count or to calculate using Roman numerals? It's very difficult, and no one really did it. Only professionals did it. Whereas as children, we all learn how to calculate with Indian or Arab numerals. And the reason why it's easy is because India invented, or India, in fact, it, it used a positional system. And when you have a positional system, you need to have a symbol for when there's nothing in that position. And other civilizations had positional systems. In Babylon, or the, for instance, they just put a mark for zero. 
But this was just a mark. It wasn't a proper number. In India, they raised the profile of this symbol for zero into a proper number. So a number, you can add zero, you can multiply by zero. Division by zero is a bit more complicated. But you can still treat zero as a proper number. Now, to me, this was very interesting. Why was it in India where zero became a number? Why not in Babylon? What about in ancient Rome or ancient Greece, who were so great at mathematics? But the Greeks, they didn't understand zero. They didn't understand zero because they had a geometric understanding of mathematics. And if there's nothing is nothing, so there's nothing to write about. <laughs> so I put on my foreign correspondent hat. I telephoned the travel agent and I flew to India to find out. So who did I go to see? I went to see this man here. <laughs> He's the Shankaracharya, Aracharya, which is, it's like a, a priest. He's a high priest of, of Hinduism. So the guy on the right is the Shankaracharya of Puri. And he's one of the most holy men in Hinduism. There are just four of them in India, and they eat one in each corner of India. And he is also the head of what is called Vedic mathematics, which is an Indian approach to numbers. So I thought he would be a good person to ask. But I can only see him in the temple, and in the temple, he is only allowed to speak in Hindi. So he has his disciple, and I need to speak to his disciple in English. The disciple speaks in Hindi. The answer comes back in Hindi, and then back to me in English. Now, this taught me, there's another mathematical concept of the geometrical progression. Something that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Because I asked the question in English, small little question, the translation into Hindi took like two minutes. <laughs> the reply took about five minutes. And the translation of the reply, ten minutes. So by the time the reply had got back to me, it was gigantic and had nothing to do with the question that I asked. And this was crazy because... The Shankaracharya speaks perfect English. So, after several hours, I was going nowhere. And I came back again. In fact, I came back several times. And each time, the interview went on for hours. And I was getting nowhere. So I decided on a different approach. I basically, I zoned out. And I started just staring at him. If we could have the, the, the picture back. So I was staring at him, and I saw that each time I saw him, he was wearing the same robe. I knew that for lunch, he always has exactly the same curry with no spice. In his room, he just has a bed with no furniture. People were coming in and lying on the floor, giving him gifts, like, like, a, like a fruit. And he would just pick the fruit and give it to someone else. And I realized that this man, the Shankaracharya, is the embodiment of nothing. 
everything about Hinduism is about the nothing. It's about letting go, about giving away, about having nothing. And in fact, it's this mystical idea of nothingness that created the context for the development and the invention of zero in India. So zero, mathematical zero, is a mathematical interpretation of a religious idea. And it's interesting because we tend to think in the modern day that religion and science are in conflict. But actually the history is a lot more complicated. And if it wasn't for the Indian mysticism, we would not have science really. Because only with Indian zero could numbers properly become the tools of science. Now, another thing I discovered when I was in India, they invented, as well as zero, the zero currency note. Now, this was invented by a non-governmental organization campaigning against bribery because you need to bribe a lot in India. And so they printed these so you would bribe someone with nothing. And I think that it's rather lovely that here again we see nothing is something. And maybe you think I'm emphasizing this idea that nothing is something and it seems so obvious but it's a really difficult idea so the Greeks well, didn't have it and no one before then now if we think about India and Indian numerals they emerged about one and a half thousand years ago and took five or six hundred years before they got to Europe. But before Indian numerals, there were Roman numerals. There were Greek numerals, which were the same as Greek letters. There were Hebrew numerals, which were Hebrew letters. There were Egyptian numerals, Phoenician, all the way back until the original, the very first symbols, the very first number system. Now, when I was learning mathematics, I didn't know any of this stuff. I assumed that numbers are as old as the hills. But actually, they were a really recent invention in human thought. Only about eight to 9,000 years old. And they were discovered or invented. That's another big debate. <laughs> but for, for a philosophy class. <laughs> in Suma or Sumeria, which is in Iraq. And why and how did numbers evolve? Without numbers, just say you had 30 sheep and your sheep were in the fields and then you went to the city and you wanted to say, I have 30 sheep to sell or something like that. How could you say it? Maybe you had a, maybe you had a stick and you would have 30 lines in the stick. Or maybe you had pebbles and you had 30 pebbles and you lined them up. This is how many I've got. Or maybe you had to say sheep 30 times, like I have sheep, 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 sheep. 
<laughs> it's not very efficient. So what they devised was a system of small clay pieces with symbols on. And these symbols emerged as being basically the first system that we had for numbers. We had words and symbols within the same system. So numbers were an invention of the accountants, of the accountants of Sumeria. But not only was this the beginning of numbers, this was the beginning of all writing systems. So the system of script in the Western world begins with numbers. We would have no books and written literature if it wasn't for numbers. Now, what is a number? Because before we invented these things called numbers, we could still count. We still knew if we were a... Ten of us in our tribe, and we meet a hundred in another tribe, we know we have to run away because there's more of them than us. It turns out that numbers we th think is one simple concept, it's actually the combination of two concepts. And the two concepts are cardinality and ordinality, which is the same thing as amount and position. So, for instance, on the front row there are four empty seats. The four seats, that's quantity. But when I count one, two, three, four, five, I'm not counting quantity. Four just means it's what comes after three and before five. Now, when I was in Japan, I wanted to do some mathematical tourism. Um, because even though math is the same everywhere, it's the universal language, two and two is four everywhere. A universal language, obviously, whose rules were set by piano. <laughs> the culture of numbers, the approach to numbers, is completely different wherever you go. For example, this pre-numbers, when we talk about tallying or counting, this is how we tally in the UK and I believe in, in Italy as well. One, two, three, four, five. So in England we call this the five bar gate because it looks like a gate. So when we're playing dominoes and we win five times, this is what we do. <laughs> links, it's a fragment almost of our prehistory. Because this is pre-writing. So I assume that everyone does this all over the world. Not true. In South America, this is what you do. One, two, three, four, five. Now, this is a much better system because from what we were seeing before, the difference between three lines and four lines, we have to think a little bit. Here, the difference between three and four, you don't need to think or do any counting. So if you're to save yourself some mental power, the next time you tally, use the Latin American way. Unless 
you find the following method even more interesting, which I do. In Asia, this is how you tally. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, this is cruelty towards children. It's so complicated and seems so unnatural. But actually, it's fantastic. Because this, it's the Chinese character, Japanese and Korea as well, for the word correct. So it's, it's almost like a poem. It's a way of using words and embra to embrace numbers. In England, we tend to see numbers as one thing, and you can be a number person, and then you can be a word person, and, and never the twain will meet. But in Asia, that's not the case. Numbers and words are all together, and you can have fun with them. And also, because there is a distinct order to the way you write all Chinese and Japanese characters, this helps to teach you to talk, uh, to, to write as well. Now, I'm remembering what comes my next slide because of the technical problems. I don't have the next one. Yes. This idea that numbers are something to play with, to have fun with, is evident in one of the biggest contributions of Japan to world culture in recent years, the Sudoku. I went to meet in Japan the man who calls himself the godfather of Sudoku, and his name is Maki Kaji. And he sees himself as an entertainer of numbers. And no sooner, no sooner than we were talking, he said, I have a new passion. It is taking photographs of car license plates. And he showed me two of them. I don't know if anyone can see why these number plates are interesting. Anyone? Okay, great. Because the top one is 3 times 5 is 15. And the bottom one is 4 times 1 is 4. So these are lines in the times table. And wherever he goes, whenever he sees a license plate, there is a line in the times table. He takes a picture. And he hopes to have an exhibition when he gets all 81. And this seems to me it's so representative of Japanese culture that we, are, we see so many numbers in our lives. We tend to want to run away. But in Japan, they embrace them. They have fun with them. Now, the greatest way that Japan is different to the West in its approach to numbers, or the most conspicuous way, is the abacus. So the abacus, and I brought an abacus to show you what one is like. It, it's, in fact, when I we lived in Brazil for five years, they had something very similar to this, but they just used it to keep rhythm at the carnival every year. So an abacus, there I have it vertically, but actually you have to use it um, horizontally. And each rod represents a digit between 0 and 9. 
and basically you can calculate addition, multiplication, subtraction much faster on an abacus than you could with pencil and paper. One million Japanese learn the abacus every year, even though you don't need to learn it for school. And they learn it at one of 20,000 after-school abacus clubs. And I... Okay, I've forgotten this one. This is... <laughs> it shows that... Um, when the electronic calculator was being introduced in the 1970s, they introduced this abacus calculator. Now, you might think that this is because you would do the sum with the abacus and then check that you were right with the calculator, but it was the other way around because they didn't trust the electronic calculator. So the abacus was there just to check that it made the right answer. So I went to one of these abacus clubs. And basically what you do is you time yourself doing ab addition, multiplication, and other sums. And I took a video, which I'm going to show you now, in which this student will add five absurdly large numbers. And, and look at the fingers to see how she does it. Okay, I will give you a big number. 10 to 14 digits. Five numbers, addition only. Are you ready? Are you starting with? 7 trillion, 425 billion, 180 million, 341,609 dollars, 40 trillion, 236 billion, 412 million, 97,386 dollars, 1 billion, 793 million, 468,520 dollars, 982 billion, 509 million, 182,467 dollars, 17 billion, 345 million, 906,273 dollars. That's all. How much did you get? Okay, please say answer in English. 48 trillion, 653 billion, 240 million, 996,205. That's right. Well done. Right. Well done. So the girl was seven years old, and there are several interesting things about that. She got it perfectly right, but she made a little mistake, which is that she couldn't remember how to say 55. Because one of the great problems that we in Europe have in understanding numbers is that we have terrible words for numbers. 50. Um, like in French, in English, in Italian. It doesn't make sense. In Japan, you can't like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, 10, 4. 2, 10. Then 2, 10, 1, 2, 10, 3. So 50 is 5, 10. And studies show that European children are one year behind their equivalents in the Far East in basic arithmetic and of all the different cultural reasons the words are 
very significant. Because we get to 10, and then in English, 11, 12, it really makes no sense at all. The other interesting thing about that is that when we add numbers, and when we multiply numbers, we start with the smallest column first. So we start with the units, then do the tens, then the hundreds, and we go that way. When you calculate with the abacus, you start with the biggest numbers and then go to the smallest numbers. So right from the beginning, you have a, an understanding of the size of the number. And you're zoning in to what the answer is. Now, oh, hang on. Now, in Japan, no one has proved that if you spend your time doing the abacus, it means that you're better at mathematics. But what they say is that when you have a given a concrete example of numbers, when you see it physically, it makes it much easier. So I went to this school, and it wasn't that I was going to the school of, uh, of, of I don't know, nerds or geeks or um, people or just the high achievers. These were just like a bunch of kids. And they, they loved it. They found it fun. And when I asked the teacher, I said, in the abacus, the way that in maths class you get some people who are brilliant and it's easy, and some people who just cannot do it. They say that doesn't happen in abacus. Yes, you get some people who are faster than others, but everyone can do it. They had never met someone who just couldn't do it. When I went to ask Yoji Miyamoto, who is the teacher here, what is the point of learning to calculate so fast where we never need to use it in the modern world, He asked me, well, what is the point of learning to run 26 miles as fast as possible? But people do that every weekend, training for the marathon. It's this idea that training one's brain to be as excellent as possible is no different from a sport. And in fact, there are other ways that learning the abacus is just like a sport. When you get good at the abacus, you get dans, which is just like in karate and judo. And there is a huge um, competitive world of, of the abacus. And I went to this regional abacus competition. The guy stands at the front, reading at the numbers as fast as he can. And they, children, answer it. This is what they can win, which is a trophy, someone holding an abacus. This year, I went back to Japan and I went to the biggest event in the Abacus calendar, the National Abacus Championships. And you can see that they all have numbers and it's sponsored by Panasonic. It's a really big event. 
And there are lots of different categories, just like a big sporting event. There is one where the person reads out the numbers, and they answer with the abacus. And it, it, look, it looks like, it sounds like thunder. There's so many beads going. And there's another category that is completely silent. Because when you get very good at the abacus, you don't need to have an abacus anymore. You just need to imagine it in your brain. So you have it in your brain, you're told the sum, or you read the sum, you move the beads in your brain, and you tell the answer. And this is called Anzan. And the largest, well, the highest profile, the most exciting event in this championship is called Flash Anzan where numbers are flashed at you and you must add them up. Now, each of the numbers is three digits long. So between 100 and 999. And if I was flashed at them, one, bam, 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 Maybe then you could type it into a computer to find the answer. Or maybe even write it down very fast. In Flash Anzan, they're flashed at you so fast that the only way to do the sum is using Anzan because you cannot write them down. I'm going to show you a clip just now. So yes, they get it completely right. So what they're doing, they see the first number and they just see it as a position on the abacus. They see the second number and they just add it to become a new position. And they reposition until at the end, they just read it out. Now, they cannot remember any of the numbers nor can they retain any of the intermediate sums. All they can do is they can just read out what is there, which is the answer. Now, Flash Anzan is a huge fad in Japan. You can get it for your, there are lots of websites to learn it. You can get it on your Nintendo, Nintendo and there are even TV programs where the best in the country compete against each other. Now, I showed you 15 digits in three seconds. The world record, which I saw, 15 digits in 1.7 seconds. So this is just, just to see. Now, one thing is interesting to try and do, try and even read one of these numbers. Just, just to read one out, just see if you can do it. And remember that the person who is adding it up can add them all up. Did anyone get that? <laughs> So, <laughs> um, there is another interesting thing about the Anzan and the Abacus, is that when we learn to do, to count normally, we use the same part of the brain that we use for language. But when we count using the Abacus, we use a different part of the brain 
which we use for our understanding of space. Yeah, a, a visuospatial sense. And what this means is that it is possible to do flash anzan whilst using the other part of the brain for language. So what the teacher showed me, which I'll show you now, is another clip with two 10-year-old girls. They are counting 30 digits in 20 seconds at the same time as playing a number game, uh, no, as a language game, a word game. This word game is called Shiritori, and the first person says Shiritori. The second person must say a new word that begins with the last syllable of the previous word. And then the next person says another word whose first syllable is the last syllable of the previous word. And let's see how they get on. Yeah, they've got it completely right. Now, you might have thought that I got there and I was filming all day until they did it right once. No, they got it right first time. And there are other interesting things about that. If you notice, they were moving in rhythm. And there's obviously something physical or using our, our motor senses to calculate as well. And it's, I once interviewed the uh, world champion at mental arithmetic who is an Indian girl who had learnt to count with an abacus. And she moved her hands like this when she was calculating because of the memory of the abacus. And I asked her, if I held your hands together, could you still calculate? And she said no. So obviously, there's something about learning the physicality of counting is important also for counting. Once I'd been to Japan, I w came back to London and I went to meet the professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University College London, who studies mathematics in the brain. And he had never seen anything like this. And, uh, you know, he, his jaw dropped and said, we need to study this. Because the abacus, even though it is the most ancient calculating tool that we have, is still really the least understood. And by looking into how the abacus and the brain work, maybe in the future we will be able to make counting in numbers easier and more accessible to, to many more people. So thank you very much. That's sort of the end of my talk.